powerful, important principle. And so thank you for being here. Our prayers, as I know we started in pre-service prayers or with everyone uh, in Uvalde connected to that tragedy. And I know some of you here have strong uh, Uvalde connections and, and people like the Spiveys lived there for several years. And I know this has to hit home for you. I've got a message out to a pastor friend not far from there. Many of you remember Sister Ruth Jackson that worshiped with us for three and a half years while she was doing her medical residency. Her The church, her dad pastors, her home church where she's at now they have a daughter work that's thriving in Uvalde and uh, uh, this uh, uh, I don't have any information as to how it relates to people who, uh, who who worship in those churches but I know in a community that size a tragedy that size touches every family and so we want to continue to pray for them and speaking of church families just before we turn to first Samuel chapter 3 uh, where's sister Penny Snyder at hey there you are sister Penny Penny Snyder is moving to South Carolina, and this will be her last service worshiping with us for a while until she gets her head and heart right and comes back to, no, no, no. Uh, uh, we, we love and appreciate her, and we're going to be praying for the Lord to bless her. And also, I know this isn't a secret, but uh, Sister Stephanie Statham and Ella and Major and Arden, they're going to be moving up back to Louisiana where their family is, and we love and appreciate them. They'll always be part of the Longview First Church family and circles. We want to pray for God's blessings to be on them and help them any way we can. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 1. We've begun a series on lessons from the life of David. It's really more like lessons from 1 and 2 Samuel. David's story really starts with Samuel. And David's story doesn't end until Jesus comes again. But the snapshot of his life really ends with Solomon. Because like all of us, it's just before us and just after us. Powerful Bible character. We're going to be doing quite a few lessons. This one will be a little different than what we normally do. If this isn't your cup of tea, it'll be fine. Come back next week. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1. And the Lord, that's verse 11, the other verse 1. I got my own copy right here. Your mind's already on getting out of school tomorrow. It is hard to find good help these days. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. It came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim and he could not see that ere a lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou calledest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. We talked about a God-given enemy last week. And how Hannah's enemy brought the will of God to pass in her life. Today we want to talk about Samuel's call. Samuel's call. Let's ask the Lord to help us. God, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, that we can know it and know it you through spirit and through truth we want your word to be real and alive and powerful in our life we want to be the people you had in mind when you died for us that we can leave here more like you every time we come let your hand be powerful tonight we pray and let us see ourselves in this book one more time in jesus name amen 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 let's just thank him together hallelujah Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. 
We brushed on this last week, and we'll talk about this part uh, in a little more detail probably next week. But Eli was the high priest at the time that our story begins. And he was a high priest who had two vile, sinful, grossly ungodly, immoral sons who happened to be priests too. And these boys in their sin caused all of Israel to sin with them. It got so bad that the Bible said that people hated the thought of going to the house of God to sacrifice because of the immorality of these two priests and we don't have time to dig into this but what a terrifyingly sad thought it is for people to not want to go worship God because some of his children particularly because of ministers being such stumbling blocks instead of stepping stones you know it's amazing in our culture in America the, the clergy used to be a noble and notable profession but now not just because of America's slide into godlessness and that slide is not taking place it is already taking place but also because of sharp Charlatans and, and television evangelists. We've kind of changed the way we view that. And so here are Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they've hurt the work of God and they've hurt the nation. And, and God wrote Eli's house off completely. He set events in order to produce Samuel's ministry because he was finished with Eli and he was finished with his sons so in this case after Samuel's mom's taking him to the house of God and giving him to Eli to raise she said God if you'll give me a son I'll give him back to you and she did Samuel is a child his mother comes to see him once a year but other than that Eli godless ungodly backward backslid Eli is his guardian now Eli couldn't raise his own boys right and now he's got a child that's not even his and he's going to raise him too the Lord has already sent a prophet to tell Eli that judgment is coming on him and that judgment is coming on his house and we look at Samuel we just read it together the Bible said the word of the Lord was precious in those days it's, it's referring to the spoken prophetic word of God given by God through the voice of prophets a spiritual manifestation the voice of God the word of God it was precious in those days now if you read three commentaries you'll get four takes on that but it's my opinion that it was precious because it was not valued and it was precious because it was not widely obeyed and when his word is not valued and when his word is not obeyed there becomes a scarcity of it you know, if you talk to people and they don't want to hear anything you say, if you're like me, you just talk to them less. There's a sweet person somewhere between the Atlantic and Pacific who I once had a series of three hour, they're not here, don't start trying to figure it out. I had a series of three hour meetings with them at their request. And for three hours, they would lie. And for three hours, I would give advice that they asked for. Then they'd leave the meeting and not do anything I suggested and not tell me or anybody else the truth about the meeting. The last time they wanted to meet, I said, you know, I can save us both three hours. There's, there's really no point in this anymore. Well, I want to tell you, if you thumb through the scripture, people who, don't, who are not interested in what the Lord has to say, he'll say a lot less. He's capable of that because all through the scripture we see that he gravitates to where he's valued and where he's welcome. He sends his word everywhere, but it's different and much more often where it's wanted. And so now God's about to speak and he's speaking through a child. I want to be obsessed with being good ground. I want to wake up every day and make sure the Lord knows I care what he thinks about me. I'm not just bringing him the list of what I want I want to know what he's interested in I want to know what he's looking for 
And so now he's written off uh, this priest and he's written off his son and he's starting over with a child. And so this boy's sleeping and he hears his name called Samuel. And in that, he jumps up. He goes straight to Eli. He said, here I am for thou didst call me. He goes to Eli. You ever wondered? Have you ever wondered what God's voice sounded like to Samuel? I've always reading this believe that it must sound like Eli's because he doesn't go to Hophni. He doesn't go to Phineas. He goes to Eli. And when Eli the high priest said, I didn't call you and he hears it again, he got up and went to Eli again. And then the third time, he went to Eli again. The high priest in this case is sinful. He is deceitful. He is, uh, he's allowing immorality to happen on the temple grounds. He is corrupt. He is dishonest. He, 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 he's rent his garment and things are bad. And I think about Caiaphas, another immoral, ungodly high priest at the trial of Jesus who's willing to lie and willing to accept lies as truth. And he rends his garment, which he's not supposed to do. He doesn't do it right. He doesn't handle it in a godly way way it's not expedient he said it's more expedient that one man die than the entire nation and John said John said that Jesus is what and Hebrews tells us he is what he is our great high priest and so here with Eli and again with Caiaphas we see a godly office that godly in, that God invented God designed the priesthood and called Aaron that was God's plan and even though God had a plan and God made an office you end up with ungodly Eli in a God given office and you end up with ungodly Caiaphas in a God given office now I want to tell you how this works if we read through the scripture you don't have to handle Eli God handled Eli and God handled Hophni and God handled Phineas and God handled Caiaphas and we got to tiptoe through life with an understanding there are things that only God can do but we can't ever look at ungodly people who are trying to corrupt godly institutions and say because that guy's immoral I'm through with the kingdom because that lady doesn't tell the truth I'm through with the kingdom because that Sunday school teacher or that youth leader or God forbid that pastor or God forbid that family honey I want to tell you it's God's he invented the priesthood and when the wrong man got into it God got him out of it and when corrupt people got involved God brought cleansing. You don't have to worry about the Lord taking care of the kingdom. God is going to see to the kingdom. Seven churches of Asia Minor. We get those letters to start Revelation. He gave a letter, a word to the angel or the messenger of the church at Ephesus. The angel, the messenger of seven different churches. The messengers, the Spanish Bible would call it the pastors of those churches. They're held in his right hand. They were not in good shape, but God handled them. Just like God handled Eli. Samuel, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. The second time, I didn't call you, my son. Go lay down. The third time, you did call me. And the light bulb goes off. It took him three times to realize the Lord's speaking to this boy. He said, do me a favor, kid. Next time the Lord calls you, next time you hear that voice, I want you to say, speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. And he did. And God said, I'm going to do a work in Israel that will tingle the people's ears. And I'll bring against Eli the judgment that I foretold of. Listen to this. Go to verse 13 to 1 Samuel chapter 3. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile, his kids did it wrong, and he restrained them not now if you've got kids I want to help you they're gonna pull stuff you'll never know about just like you pulled stuff that your mom and dad still 
don't know about. He's a priest. And his boys aren't just doing stuff like kids do. They're doing this stuff in the house of the Lord. And they're doing it in front of him and everybody else. God's not angry with him because his children are sinful. God's angry with him because those boys live at home. And they work for him. And he restrained them not. He knows what's happening. But he's not doing anything about it. I used to scratch my head, but now we live in that day. I know people who are more concerned with their children's feelings and reaction than they are God's. I do not understand it. If you love your kids, you're going to tell them what Jesus wants you to tell them for their own good. But, oh, we don't have time for that. Verse 14. It's the next verse. Yeah. For therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house should not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. He said he didn't restrain them, so I'm done with it. Their sin and their iniquity and their corruption and their selfishness, and we're not just going to let this go. We're not going to sweep it under the rug. I'm not going to cleanse them because of what they've done. A bullock and a ram's not going to take care of this. They pushed me so far, and they've caused so many others to stumble, and they've made such a wreck, and so many people have backslid because of them. I I am finished with them. See, God had given Eli an opportunity. He stood up and told him what was going to happen if he didn't get a handle on those boys. I'll remember our first revival together. I was 19 years old, and uh, we had been married for months. I think we were married in September. And this was the next May, if I'm not mistaken. And, and we were in Tarkington Prairie, Texas. Uh, and I knew the Lord moved on me. It, one of the first times he'd ever spoken to me quite like that, not the first, but one of the first and I looked around that church in the middle of a midweek service and I just knew so I went ahead and said it I'm giving an altar call and I started for lack of a better term I'm, I'm practically climbing up the pulpit and I said you better listen to me we can't brush through this because this is somebody's last service you've got to get this right now I'm looking around and everybody there looked Pentecostal I didn't know about Sam Dykes there with his sweet wife backslid for years I didn't know anybody there except for the pastor and his family. And we had a great altar call and people moved, but Sam didn't. That was on Wednesday. Saturday, they found his body. Tragic accident involving a tractor, and we're not going to get into the details. Sunday, I'm back. He's in the morgue. Monday, we have church that night. Tuesday mornings is viewing and then his funeral and church Tuesday night. Before that revival's over, 47 people receive the Holy Ghost. Before that revival's over, we saw miracle after miracle. That revival turned us into full-time evangelists, but it didn't do anything for Sam Dykes. God didn't just write him off. God cried out to him and called out to him, and he tried to help him. And when God's crying out to us and calling out to us, honey, we need to be recipient to that. We're playing for all the marbles. He's a kid. Samuel's a child. But when he hears God's voice, he jumps right up. And he runs to Eli's room. I wonder if God had spoken to Hophni in Eli's voice. What the boy would have done. I wonder if God called out to Phineas's voice in Eli's voice in the middle of the night. What the boy would have done. Samuel said, here I am. Now, he doesn't yet know the difference in God's voice and who's supposed to be the man of God's voice. He don't know, but I got to give him this. He did run. The second time he ran, the third time he ran, 
Because he understood at the very beginning the value, not to people, not to institutions, the value of obedience to God. The value of obedience to God. Some people struggle their entire life because they never can quite grasp the fact that I am not my own. I've got to be obedient to him. It's not my wishes or my whims or my outlook or my thoughts. I've got to be obedient to him. I'm not going to like it all. I'm not going to enjoy it all. But this is all for him. It's not my nature or my outlook. I've got to be obedient to him. God's eye is on him even as a child. And the more tender and obedient we are to his voice, the better off we're going to be. And God sees this in this boy and responds to this in this boy. And everything he's going to do in the man, he's going to do because he's obedient, just like he was when he's a boy. He said, Samuel, I'll begin this, and I'll make an end. God is so amazing. The way he handles things. He can heal bodies and save souls and deliver. Now we've got, I've got in my redneck nature, this desire, I'm just going to fix all of that. And we don't listen to Jesus. We'll tear up a lot of wheat, get rid of a tear. Oh, I better not get started on that. I've known folks who decided they're going to fix the church they attend. And no matter how many people backslide, if I can get rid of that one jerk who doesn't think like I think and doesn't want what I want and doesn't tick like, if I, oh my goodness, God is able to take care of all of this. Eli's lack of commitment, Eli's restraint has caused God to just write him off and his ungodly boys. God is done with him. Listen to this, Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. And the Lord said, I shall hide from Abraham that shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do listen to this he said I'm not going to slip this by him verse 18 seeing that Abraham surely hath become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him now why does God curse Eli and bless Abraham why does he write Eli's house off and say, I'm going to embrace Abraham's house. Abraham is not perfect. Isaac is not perfect. Brothers and sisters, Abraham's grandchildren are grossly imperfect. So how come God curses one family, but he blesses another? Verse 19, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring unto Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God can bless Abraham because he says, I know when I give him kids, he's going to command them to do things my way in 2022. God help us if we don't have a revival of commanding our children. Now, people who allow them to make their own choices. They can't, they can't pick whether they do drugs or not. They can't choose how immoral they are. They can't choose what they stream or what what they watch or even where they spend the night but I allow them to make their own spiritual choices that is unbiblical and anti-godly if you love God or your children you've got to love them enough to command them in righteousness they'll do whatever they want with it but while they're at my house they're going to know what he wants and what he says I owe that to them I owe that to him can I give you a James Moore take that pondering this scripture is brought to me. We're trying to fight all the wrong battles. If you want to help your kids, mouthing off to an adult should become the highest sin they can commit while they're in your house. It's the truth. Because I've watched this for a while. And people who can say whatever they want to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and teachers and coaches and aunts and uncles and babysitters. It's not going to stop there. None of us are designed to do well with authority. 
None of us like or enjoy submission in any form. We just don't. And if we're going to be God's, it's because we're going to be submitted to him entirely. If I can't submit my desires and whims and wishes to him, I don't have a prayer. Literally. So if you love your kids, you've got to teach them to see the Lord the correct way. Which unfortunately involves teaching them to see you the correct way. So what does God see in Samuel? He's quick to obey. 1 Samuel 13, let's go back to verse 16. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah. And Benjamin, the Philistines, encamped in Michmash. That's 13. I need three. I'm sorry. We're going to make that your fault. It might be mine. I thought we were skipping ahead about four lessons. Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son... And he answered, here am I, 17. And he said, what is this thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he has said unto thee. You tell me what God really said, or I'm going to make him do all this and worse to you. Eli knows it's bad news. Samuel's afraid to tell him what God had said. Eli didn't hold back, so Samuel didn't hold back. Verse 18, Samuel told him everything every wit and hid nothing from him he said it is the Lord let him do what seemeth to him good verse 19 and Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground now some people believe that means that Samuel didn't let any of God's word fall to the ground he did whatever God said Others believe that Samuel walked in a godly vein and God didn't let any of Samuel's words fall to the ground. That everything he prophesied, foretold of, spoke, came to pass. I've heard it both ways. Well, what do you think? I'm glad you asked. I think both of those are true. Both of those are true. See, if you'll obey God's word and give yourself to God's cause, it'll change what you say. It'll change what you pursue. And if you'll give yourself to God's word, he'll change how he deals with your words. Proverbs chapter 11. Uh, can you get verse 20 for me? Proverbs eleven twenty. They that are of a froward heart are abomination to the Lord. But such as are upright in their ways are his Delight the, the froward, the crooked. Uh, he, he, they play fast and loose with God's ways and God's rules. He said they're an abomination to the Lord. But those that are upright in their way are his delight. So God abhors Eli and he delights in Samuel. My life gets so much simpler if I just live it saying, God, I want you to delight in me. I, I want to do things that make you happy that I'm here. I want to bring you joy. That's right, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 30. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel hath I said indeed that my house and the house of my father shall walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. God says, I want to bless you and your line forever. But you're not that interested in me. So here's how it works. I'm going to honor people that honor me. I'm going to bless people. That bless me. This is really, really, really simple. If you want God to take care of your life, you give your life to him. If you make God's business your business, he'll always take care of what belongs to you. If our life is about honoring him, not accomplishing our goals, not fulfilling our wishes, not even achieving our dreams, but my life is about honoring him, then he'll always take care of my life. He said, they that despise me, I'm going to esteem them lightly. we got to hurry. Psalm 18. Let's start at verse 16. 
He sent from above. He took me and drew me out of many waters. Keep going. And he delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me. For they were too strong for me. But he took me out of that. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Got enemies, got problems coming against me everywhere. Chaos enveloping my life. And I just decided that I was going to delight in the Lord. And I was going to honor him. And because he delighted in me, he delivered me. Verse 20. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. Hath he recompensed me in the middle of the fight, in the middle of the political fight, in the middle of the fight at work, in the middle of the nasty divorce, in the middle of the family issue, in the middle of the backstabbing and the mud slinging. It's hard to keep your hands clean. This is where we find out, do I trust God enough to let him handle that garbage or do I have to become twisted? Do I trust God enough to handle that garbage or do I have to start breaking my word? Do I trust God to get me through? this or do I need to lie do I need to scheme honey if you'll put it in his hands he'll delight in you and he can do more in a moment how do I keep my hands clean for I've kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God not gonna lie to win the election or get the promotion because I'm not going to wickedly depart. There's no such thing as lying for Jesus. I'm not going to wickedly depart. You know those sweet folks? I'm going to make up a story, a testimony, to try to get them to come to the altar. and I'm going to lie for the king. If you'll not wickedly depart from him, he will take care of you. When he sees us serving him in the chaos, he delights in that. 22, we got to hurry. For all his judgments were before me. And when I have enemies and chaos and I'm being swallowed up, I did not put away his statutes from me. Well, I know what the Bible says, but sometimes you've got to fight fire with fire. There's a word for that, backslid. I know what the Bible says, but whatever you're about to say next is foolish. And it'll make a fool out of you if you go down that road. Oh, I wish I had time for this. There was a pastor who I admire who was uh, preaching one night. And th- there, there was a lady in, uh, in that church. And by her own testimony later, he, he tipped into something that happened to be her closet battle. The old timers would have called it her closet sin. We don't use that word anymore. People are just confused. And he's tiptoeing all over it. And she's getting mad. I mean, really, really, really mad. And the person on her right jumped up and bellowed out a message in tongues. And the person on the left jumped up and bellowed out the interpretation. And it literally said, you have loved my servant's preaching until tonight when it is pointed at you. And at that moment, she let out a cry and said, oh, God and she realized something about herself this is really simple I want to be somebody God can talk to I don't want him to have to tiptoe around me and worry about how I'm going to take it I want to know what he wants I want to know what he likes I want to know what he hates I want to be his God deals with me because he loves me if he convicts you it's because he cares for you you have trouble when he says Eli you do whatever you want son I'm not going to bother you anymore whom the Lord loveth he chastises verse 23 I got to hurry I was also upright before him I kept myself from iniquity. I'm in the fight of my life, but I'm not going to sin to win it, he said. Keep going. Notice that. God keeps me. I'm not dead because God keeps me. I'm not starving because God keeps me. I'm not in jail because God keeps me. But David said, I've kept myself. See, if I keep myself 
from responding and living in unbiblical and ungodly ways, then he'll keep my path. God will keep me from the hand of the devil. But I've got to keep myself. He is the truth, but I've got to tell the truth. He'll take care of the end of my story, but I've got to be moral. I've got to keep myself moral. Therefore, hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness. Thank God that's not how it always is. According to the cleanness of my hands and his eyesight. He's talking about the middle of a terrible fight. He said, but I stayed right and God won it for me. But the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. I want you to think about the person right now you're angry at that and can't forgive and quote that verse to yourself. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with an upright man, Thou will show thyself upright, verse 26. With the pure, thou will show thyself pure. With the forward, thou will show thyself forward. If you're dishonest in how you deal with God. See, you can fool everybody here, but we can't help you anyway. This is about you and Jesus. We're perverse and crooked. And low down and self-centered, he doesn't have to take care of us. We've got our own reward, but when we give it to him, he deals with me the way I deal with him. Now, he's more powerful, don't get me wrong. I give a little and I get a lot, but he deals with me the way I deal with him. When I'm honest and open before him, he responds in kind. Isaiah 66, we got to hurry. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Keep going. For all those things hath my hand made, and those things have been, saith the Lord. But unto this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my work. Buildings don't impress him. He's looking for somebody who sees themselves as impoverished. They're not proud of who they are and what they are. They know they're still that same broken person they were years ago. But God showered mercy and love and kindness and blessing on them. He said, you're not going to build a building that will impress me. I'm looking for somebody who will tremble at my word. I thank God for this building. I thank God for the last one and the one before that and the earth and floor building before that and the brush armor that Pentecost started in in our city that became this church. But if you take all that away, we'd be better off meeting behind a dumpster in a back alley and trembling at the word of God than we're ever going to be if we invent enough stuff us to not even know if he's talking to us or not. You've got to tremble not just at his spirit but at his word. Verse 3. we got to hurry. He that killeth an ox as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth the lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offered an oblation as he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as he blessed an idol. Yea, that have chosen their own ways and their soul delighteth in their abominations. They don't want my ways. Verse 4. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Right. Now, whether you're worried about gas prices or the Antichrist or the collapse of the global economy or food shortages, don't be stupid. You know, it's, it's probably not the best time to, to never mind, we're not going to get into that. You hear me, we're doing this wrong if we live in perpetual fear. That's not how we're supposed to work. He goes, here's the deal. When I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes. And chose that which I delight in not. He said, I'm going to be forward to the forward. But when he called Samuel, the boy answered him instantly. We got to hurry. Five, hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. we got to hurry. Proverbs 123. Turn 
ye at my reproof. When, when the word of God and the voice of God finds me, I need to turn. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. Wait. If I turn when the word of God tells me I'm doing this wrong, thinking wrong, living wrong, if I'll respond to that, he'll pour his spirit out on me. I will make known my word unto you. This is how it works. We got to hurry. Verse 24, because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Didn't want the Bible telling me what I'm doing wrong. I also will laugh at your calamity. God, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to live this. I'm not going to do that. I'm not changing. This is who I am. He said, okay, Bubba, when you're in trouble, that's your problem. Don't think I'm going to come in there and bail it out. If you don't care what I think, then I really don't care what you I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Oh, my goodness. We got to hurry. And when your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress as anguish cometh unto you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they that hated knowledge, I don't really care what the Bible says. They hated knowledge, I don't really care what God thinks, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. See, we've got a generation of people who want God's healing, and they want His joy, and they want Him to gush in in the middle of Sunday morning worship, and they just want butterflies, and, 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 but they don't really care what He says about their Tuesday nights and their entertainment choices and the words that come out of their mouth and, and what goes in their eyes and what comes out of their heart. That's not going to work. Therefore, shall they eat of the fruit of their own way. God's not having to send me any trouble. I'm going to get what I'm digging. And be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. God help us that we don't become a people who will trade our soul for another raise and a bigger house and further our career. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Can I help you? Let me tell you how we do it at my house. I want my kids to chase their dreams. If they're smart enough to get into the college, I'll find a way to send them there. But they're not going anywhere until we found out and made dead certain there's a church there that they can thrive in. Because I'm far more concerned with their eternity than I am their career or their time. Yes, amen. But whoso hearketh unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Let's stand together. You know what makes us safe? Don't take this wrong. There's a loaded gun in my nightstand. I'm not saying don't defend yourself. There's a spare tire in my truck. Don't take this wrong. I've got life insurance. Do you know what makes us safe? Jesus does. Jesus does. I've got to delight in him. So he'll delight in me. John 15, 3. Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. This is so different than where we're going, but you hear me. God wants a people where his will and his word and his direction is honored. And we'll never stand for righteousness while being unrighteous. God, help us that we don't confuse meek with weak. But you hear me. You hear me. He wants a people that are obsessed with him. And when he finds that, he'll show himself strong for them. He blesses obedience he defends those who do it his way we have challenges ahead of us unlike any in our particular nation's history you hear me he's going to help us 
But we cannot become so distracted and angry, godless anger, not righteous indignation, and frustrated that we miss the point of what he wants to do in our midst. I've got enemies, congratulations. And obstacles and oppositions. But if I'll make sure that I'm godly while I tiptoe through the chaos, it's his job. It's his job to get me through it. My destination is his responsibility. You're taller than me now. Remember when you were this big? You weren't very bright back then. And what a struggle it was. You know how it is when your first child's born, it's so odd because your heart's not inside of your body anymore. This is a terrible thing because you want to protect them and help them. It's exceedingly difficult when they won't listen. Remember one particular day we were in a, you were walking by then. You were just starting to get good at it, and I was still unaccustomed to those instant zero to 60 bursts. We had talked a lot about parking lot safety, but you weren't very interested in it. You're probably two. We're trying to get you in the truck. Mom dropped something, and then one eighth of a second. Grabbed you by your collar. And you couldn't have put a football between you and that car that shot down the line. very bright you giggled I wanted to hug you and kill you at the same time we're not going to talk about what happened next that fast if you've raised a child you know what it is you're trying to help them and there are seasons where they are the biggest obstacle to their own help it's hard to convince a two-year-old you're smarter than they are. That you know things they don't. How must the Lord feel when his eyes fall on me? Now you hear me. I don't have to understand his words or his instruction. I've just got to obey them. If I'll do that and give myself to it, he'll delight in me. Can we close our eyes together? I know I'm preaching to the Wednesday night crowd. But if you find yourself saying, my relationship with God, or maybe you've simplified it to just church, that's a problem too. It's just not doing for me what it's always done. It doesn't hit me like it used to hit me. It doesn't move me like it used to move me. Can you ask yourself something? Is he still my delight? Is he what I get up for in the morning? And while I'm navigating the chaos of my days, is his pleasure my focus and my obsession? You hear me. If you delight in him, he'll delight in you. And you'll never lack for deliverance. You'll never lack for help. He loves you. More than you love that first child or grandchild you held in your hands. He loves you. More than you love yourself. It's an everlasting love. If you'll let him, he'll take care of you. In Jesus' name, I'm four minutes late, but can we just find a place and talk to him for a moment? I want to be like Samuel, his word, his voice, his, I just want to listen to it. It doesn't matter what it says, if I know it's God, that's what I want to be, and that's what I want to do more than anything else in this world. I want him to delight in me, in Jesus' name.